haven't changed a bit. I don't think. I haven't. Don't think. Don't think. Don't think. The dress has changed. And that cardigan was made for me by Grandma. And Nicola had bought one. But like all top acts, St Winifred had paid their dues. Brian and Michael for you now, better known as Burke and Jerk around the Northern Clubs, and listen to this song. Great stuff. They were on this too. You painted Salford smoke it up some cardboard boxes from the shop. And we did the backing track, and we went down to St. Winifred to say, please, will you see them in the But without the necessary licenses, the trip to Top of the Pops for the underage singers turned into a nightmare. We had a coach full with all the St. Winifred's original kids, and then the saddest news that they could ever hear, it was quite a blow for us as well, was that they couldn't pay. Someone from the record company had to send out to uh, a stage school to get some older kids in. Terry Foley from St. Winifred's and us were re rehearsing these kids in the corridor. I just, it just felt wrong to me. It just, I, I was so really upset and very half-hearted about it. And of course they would insist on singing it, how they thought all Northern children must sing it, which, you know, we didn't. And I resented it <laughs> very much. But revenge is a dish best enjoyed cold. And guided by the business acumen of Sister Aquinas, they went for a hit of their own. Before long, the Mancunian Moppets were ankle sock deep in filthy lucre. For me, as a nun, I, I, my world was, it was turned upside down. <laughs> I um, have a bow of poverty and all, all this money was coming in, royalties and um, the music too. I mean, uh, my life had been quite a quiet life, so... Uh, it got quite exciting, but I think the staff enjoyed it and the children enjoyed it. Strawberry Studios, yeah. do you remember? Yeah. And you used to, they used to make us Imto in the break. And arrow bars. Yeah. We had arrow bars. Yeah. Banana arrow bars if you were, if if you you were good. good. The song climbed the chart, but then tragedy struck. Are you certain that he was dead at the moment that the uh, first shot hit his body? John Lennon got shot. And it was at number two, and John Lennon was below us at the time or something like that. And Sister came out with something very unholy at that stage, I think. Which, <laughs> which was, we're not going to make it or something like that. But uh, John Lennon did go to number one eventually, but we actually did just get to number one before him. I remember where I was stood, and I remember who I stood next to on there. And I remember having to be quick because Bob Geldof was coming on afterwards. On occasion I was a little bit starstruck by it all, but the children were sort of very matter of fact. You know, even to point out to the boomtown rats that they were miming, you know, and <laughs> should they be miming when we weren't miming? If you were under 16 you have to have a licence to appear on the television. And I was actually on holiday when they got the licences. So um, I didn't get a license, and um, I've never forgiven my mother <laughs> for going on holiday at that particular time. Yeah, because then you wouldn't start to tell us about us. Yeah, because well. they went to Pebble, Pebble Mill at one then, didn't you? The he next gave day. us a lollipop. Mm. <laughs> and did he say he loves your baby, or did he, he just baby? Did he? Of course he did. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma knocked Abba off number one, but with the typical big-heartedness that's given them the best welfare state in Europe, the Swedes invited the choir to back them at a UK concert. And we knew that there was like however many hundreds of people there, but you couldn't see anybody because the lights were so bright. But it was like that whenever you went on stage. But there was always a group of people wasn't it, that you knew would faint. Yeah. The call, I the call fainted. Away, but yeah, you knew. Yeah. And you knew if you were stood next to them, you'd have to hold them up. It was very wonderful. The music, of course, I, I always loved uh, Abba's music, so it was really very lovely. That was one of the highlights of my whole career, I should think. Now the right old age of 20, Dawn Rouse. The dizzy pinnacle of all this was meeting silver-haired charmer Mike Aspel. The cherubic dawn came too. I remember one particular time 
um, we were going to make a religious programme and uh, my dad was out of work and my sister gave my mum some money for a new dress for the programme and we love a lot. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank God bless. All sorts of things happen in the British charts and this is to prove they're so versatile, I guess. With a little lady in the front who's only eight years of age, St Winifred's School Choir. And he means that most sincerely. But hard-bitten rock cynics weren't as charitable as Peter Powell. And I think to actually knock a song like Grandma, that you are insulting the people who've actually bought it. And also everybody that was involved in the song itself. When did you last have a number one hit? Yeah. I mean, I have never met anybody um, on, a, on a social level, you know, worked with who can turn around and say, oh, we've had a number one hit, or we were part of a number one hit. Grandma, we love you. Grandma, we do. Though you may be far away, <laughs> we think of you. And one day, when we're older, There's no one quite like Grandma, she has helped us on our way.